As we start this afternoon, we have a special treat and we're incredibly fortunate to have put together a group of three speakers, each in their field uh, to help us to understand this area of cardiology. Each presenter will do a brief lecture and then after the pres uh, all of the presentations are done, then we'll do questions. So there won't be questions at the end of each one of them, but as we bring them all together. First, we have Dr. Muhammad Khalid Ghani, who is gonna be talking about uh, TARVA current understanding and applications. Dr. Gandhi is an interventional cardiologist at Oklahoma Heart and completed his medical degree at the Army College in Pakistan. Dr. Gandhi is a board certified cardiologist and in interventional cardiology. After him, then we will hear from Dr. Inslee, Douglas Inslee, who is presenting Raising the Titanic, trans, transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge mitral valve repair of functional mitral regurgitation. Dr. Inslee is a cardiologist at St. Francis Hospital, completed his medical degree at the University of Texas Southwestern School in Dallas, and is board certified in internal medicine, cardiovascular medicine, and interventional medicine. And finally, in our group, we uh, will be presenting on non-pharmacological management of atrial fibrillation is Dr. Cotty Jewell. Dr. Jewell is a cardiac electrophysiologist at Oklahoma Heart and completed his medical degree at Texas University School of Medicine and is board certified in cardiology and electrophysiology. Please welcome me in uh, meeting this group of panelists who will begin the discussion. So, All right, it's a pleasure and privilege to be here. Uh, I was the last minute shoe in for somebody. I do not know who dropped out. So, hey. Uh, <laughs> but I'll fill in in any shoe, it, it doesn't matter. I have a big shoe myself. Okay, so it's basically, it's like telling the history of the world in about 20 minutes. That's the time I was allotted, 20 minutes to uh, get it done. I'm like, okay, well, Adam was born and then Tabor came along. In any case, uh, it's something like that in there. So how many are medical students over here? No, no medical students, residents, interns? No, faculty only, or, all right. I just wanted to see how much depth I need to go into. The basic uh, uh, premise or, uh, of this talk is to kind of understand the disease and understand when you can help your patient and what are your options, okay? I'll simplify it as much as you like to, on, I can go into details as much as you like me to. In any case, it's a progressive disease. This, risk factors are the same what they are for coronary disease. If you have high cholesterol, high blood pressure, lifestyle, calcium and plaque is going to develop and deposit on the aortic valve. And as the time goes by and the population ages, you are going to have more and more of this problem. But to realize that this is not a benign problem, it's not something which you can say, okay, well, you know, you have aortic stenosis, uh, see you John in six months. No, six months, John may be dead, all right? So this is a pretty big misconception that you can ride aortic stenosis and see the patient back. Uh, I'll give you some statistics on that and that those statistics, statistics have come along since we have started doing TAVR and realized that a lot of these people who were considered non-surgical and uh, they would just go home and fizzle away and but what time did it take them to fizzle away? You know, whether they were alive in a year, whether they were alive in six months or no. But as you can see on this, that 3% of the severe inoperable, quote unquote, inoperable uh, aortic stenosis will be alive at five years. And you can compare it to the rest of the cancers. So just to put things in perspective, that this is not something which is to be taken lightly. Now, once they present with symptoms, then it's all systems go. If you have a patient of aortic stenosis who is presenting with symptoms and the common symptoms are going to be oh, angina, syncope and heart failure. Once they come with heart failure, their average survival is less than two years. So once they come to you and they're saying, hey, I'm having chest pressure, tightness, discomfort, shortness of breath, see the swelling in my ankles and feet, if you don't do something immediately, you are going to lose that patient. That is the message I want to send. Now, now the volume has gone up, obviously, of the aortic valve surgeries. 
And we are still perfecting the technology. Things are improving. Complication rates are coming down. And obviously, all of this goes in context uh, with keeping an eye out on the patient. But if, as I said, about 4% of the people who saw you today for aortic stenosis, for whatever reason, they said, hey, I'm getting short of breath. You have, okay, you have severe aortic stenosis. Let's send you to a team which was going to replace your valve. The team says, we are booked for two months. 4% will be dead. You six, six months, about 25% will be dead. So if you just wait on them and say, okay, well, when the team says, okay, we'll take care of you. Well, it may be too late, but the thing is that the propensity and the amount of population and the people who are getting older, uh, 65 and above, the people who have coronary disease, they are going to have more valvular heart disease. And so you can see the population which is getting older by 2030 is going to increase. This is the population which is going to be over 65. And these are the people who are going to have this problem. Now, and as you can see, a good amount is still not being treated. So this is something which has to be you know, taken into account and see if we can get the right treatment to the right patient in a timely fashion. Can you guys read this even? No, doesn't look like it. I can read it up there, but this is a little blurry. I just want you to, you know, uh, I know previously that we used to just have, you know, mild stenosis, moderate, moderate to severe, and then severe stenosis. And severe stenosis, we used to say, okay, well, let's treat them, you know, or maybe treat them. Now we have this classification, which I want to just elaborate a little bit on, and that is uh, stage D1. So these are people who have symptomatic, severe aortic stenosis. And what is the criteria for severity? It's not a, a cath criteria, it's an echo criteria. The normal transthoracic echo gives you the criteria for severe aortic stenosis a velocity above four meters per second and a mean gradient above 40 millimeters of mercury. Two simple criteria. If they have it, they will, and they are, they are symptomatic, they are going to fall into stage D1. The current recommendation is valve replacement. It doesn't say TAVR or SAVR or whatever you want to call it, okay? But, but you have to get them to a valve replacement. Current concept is that all of these patients need to be dealt in a, with a heart team, not with an isolated, okay, see the cardiologist. Okay, well, the cardiologist might say, okay, see the surgeon. You, are, you don't want, so the institution should build a heart team. All the big institutions or the good institutions, all the institutions who are interested in this pathology have a heart team approach. There's no longer an individual approach. Why? Because you come in, especially in Oklahoma, the way we have built it up is uh, we have a clinic where you show up because people are coming from 100 miles, 200 miles. They are in rural areas. They don't want to come five times. They don't want to see me, then see somebody else, then see the third person. And so we bring them in. We do all the testing and all the uh, consulting in a single day. It's a long day for them. But whatever they need, whether they need an angiogram, which we encourage the referring physicians to get it done beforehand, TEE, CT scans, consults, and then we look at everything included and we say, okay, well, you qualify for a TAVR, no, you qualify for a SAVR, or this is what we are going to do, and or we cannot do it for whatever reason. So I'll go on to the next phase where, so when we started the TAVR journey, it started with inoperable patients. That means you send them to a surgeon because that was the only option. There's no heart team concept over there. You send them to a surgeon. Surgeon says, well, for X, Y, and Z reason, I cannot operate. Go home. You have had a good life. Enjoy the rest of your days and we are done. So that was the first subset of people that got treated. That got treated with, uh, you know, so they were inoperable, which the surgeon outrightly refused. They said, we are done. You have had a good life. Go home. Then we proved with the TAVR industry that, okay, we can do these people and give them a reasonable life expectancy. Then we went to high risk. High risk, you know, the risks are defined, 
on an STS score. STS is a short-term risk score on a surgical basis. And you, you can download that app. It takes about 100 points into account and gives spits out a score. So <clears throat> high risk means their STS score is above eight or something like that. And that means they are going to not do very well with surgery. So that is the second phase that was dealt with. Then the third phase came intermediate risk, four to eight STS score. Then the fourth phase came low risk, which means anybody who is in good health has aortic stenosis, hey, can, can we do a TAVR on him or does he really need to have open heart surgery? So, but the concerns remained were that, uh, remain a concern with TAVR, including stroke, vascular complications, paravalvular leak, and conduction disturbances. So these were the four, usually people have two HLEs heals, but these were the four HLEs heals over here for the TAVR. So we needed to fix these things to say, okay, well, you know what? A person who is walking down the road is in good health, has no issues, and needs a valve replaced, can we do a TAVR on him or not? But we have to fix these issues. Otherwise, you cannot compete with surgery. And the competition is a healthy competition. It's not a competition, at least at my institution, we have a healthy competition in the sense we are not trying, we are trying to do the best for the patient, whatever it takes. What we think is best for Mr. X, Y, and Z, that's what we are going to do. We are not going to say, okay, well, you know what? I do TAVRs, you do surgery. I, you're not going to, I'm not sending you this patient. Well, the patient is going to benefit from surgery. You go for surgery. You know, that is what, that is where the heart team approach uh, comes from. So, so uh, going back, we are saying we need to reduce the stroke, vascular complications, paravalvular leak, and conduction disturbances. A high uh, rate of people were getting pacemakers on, on TAVRs. So how did we do that? Rate of stroke. We made the catheter more flexible, nimble, and navigationable. So we were trying to avoid scraping the aorta coming in and causing the plaque to go into the uh, brain and cause to have a stroke. So the catheter uh, improved. Then we started, when we started the trials, and uh, I'm, I'm one of those uh, who started long time ago, 15 years ago, when we started with the inoperable and everything else. I know I look very young, you're all amazed, isn't that? <laughs> but, uh, but we started with that and we had a 24 French sheet. 24 French is literally as thick as my big finger over here. And there are these little old ladies who are coming in for surgeries. Unfortunately, we did a lot of harm, but even then, despite doing all that harm with the primitive technology, we still provided a lot of service to these inoperable patients. So now what has happened is we have decreased the size. These are the valve sizes on the top, 20 millimeter, 23 millimeter, 26 millimeter, 29 millimeter. These are the standard valves. Now there is going to be a time, I think in the near future where you will have 3D printed valves where you will have it customized to you. You know, you will have the exact valve what you need, not a generic number but that is down the road. But we decrease the French size to 14, 14, 14, and 16. That means now this is half of this finger. And it means that you can put up these catheters in a 5.5 millimeter vessel. And femorals are usually seven, eight millimeters. So even in older people, we can get through a lot of this. And so we have reduced the stroke rate. We have reduced the vascular complications and so this has resulted in all of these valves being, so this is the one we started with, then we went to the XT valve, then came the Sapien 3 valve, and then came the Ultra valve. Why am I mentioning these? Because I have the most experience with these. I'm not trying to hawk any industry. We do both Medtronic, this, you know, Edwards, et cetera. We started all the trials with these, so I have more experience with this and so, but, um, Going back over here. So what happened with all these innovations, quote unquote, uh, you can see that as the trials progressed and the valves changed, you can see 30 day all cause mortality, 5%, 5.1%. There's a number of things in there. It's just not the valve. It's the operator. We learned how to do these things. And then obviously the technology improved and we figured out going forward, what is the most important thing we need to pay attention to while doing these procedures. And it came down to 0.4%. So that is pretty good for any cardiac surgery. 
you do 0.4% surgery cannot match it. And uh, disabling stroke, zero. How did that happen? Just as we understand, as we progress, as our experience gets better, 0%. And then moderate to severe paravalvular leak. These valves used to leak around them. And now we are down to 0.5%, which is, uh, you know, usually now we are good enough to understand who is going to develop a paravalvular leak. And if they are a surgical candidate, we would send them to surgery rather than try to put a TAVR valve in them. So the, again, it's not just the valve, it's the understanding and how it works and uh, how it's going to progress. So things improved. Now the, the biggest question still remains uh, is the durability of the valve. You have to know how durable it's going to be. So this is a Medtronic valve, uh, which has a supra annular design. So it has less stress on the leaflet. So we think that it may be a little bit more durable. We are not sure. So this is, I'm just giving you, and now Edwards has come out with a new technology where they have uh, coated the valve. They call it the Resilia technology, which reduces the amount of plaque built up on the valve itself. So we, only time will tell. Next year, a 10 year data is going to be out on one of the trials to see how it has fared as compared to surgery. So we are going to wait and see that. So again, going over uh, patients who cannot undergo surgery, valve replacement in high risk patients, intermediate risk patients. So can we do low risk patients? The one which I was talking about, can we go to the low risk patients? So we did, uh, uh, again, we were part of that trial, partner three trial, and we went to the low risk. Um, it was one-to-one -one randomization, thousand patients, half get surgery, half get tab. And uh, I just wanted to put up this map to show that, yes, we, we did it. And um, again, the big baseline characteristics were the same. They were below, the STS score was below four. So that is how you define whether somebody, so it's a standardized defined criteria. It's not just that I think this is low risk and this is high risk. If their STS is below four, then they are low risk. All right. So, you know, and you know what, if somebody will notice or no, they, somebody in my slide deck switched the surgery to TAVR. So, but in any case, uh, this is TAVR, the red line, and the surgery is this. So all composite of death, stroke, and rehospitalization Everything was better if you get a TAVR. The rate of all strokes was better in TAVR, 1.2 versus 3.1 in surgery. And so if you look at the bigger picture and the secondary endpoints, which were supposed to be defined, everything favored the TAVR side of the equation rather than, so it is not just a fluke, but you also have to realize that, you know, the industry is very clever. They do not want their valves to be dismissed or something. These are all people, but at the same time, these were all experienced operators who had gone through the mill and they were doing towers. And on the other hand, they were all experienced uh, surgeons as well. So it's not like the surgeons did not have an ex enough experience. And so that's why the result was not as good. And the secondary endpoints, new onset atrial fibrillation, length of hospitalization, et cetera, et cetera, everything favors because it's not open surgery. So that is not uh, rocket science over here. But even now, as we speak, I showed you a slide showing that it's about 60% of the people are going to go untreated. A lot of the ethnic populations are going to go untreated as well. 92% of the people are white, black, Hispanic, and Asians are a small percentage of they're relative uh, to the population uh, they are representing. Then came COVID, everything fell down the drain uh, because these were considered elective surgeries. Although, as I have showed you, that this is not elective surgery. If you do not treat them, they are going to be dead. You know, it's not something, but everything went down. But now the, ta the volume now is, this is the historical over here where it used to be surgery. Now surgery is about 40% and TAVR is about 60%. People, and a lot of it is, some of it is, you know, we have to convince people what is good for them. A lot of people come up with a preconceived idea what is good for them. Because they have heard somebody can replace a valve from the groin, they say, well, we want a TAVR. We don't want you to be messing with the surgeon. We have to really convince them if we think really that this is important, that, uh, 
And I wanted to go over this uh, classification a little bit because severe aortic stenosis, as we understand, has different criteria. So uh, you have people at risk, the risk factors, which we just talked about, are the same as coronary heart disease. Then they are progressive, which means they have moderate stenosis. The gradient is going to be between 20 and 40, not above 40. And then you are going to have asymptomatic severe cases. Now, asymptomatic, they'll walk in and they'll say, I'm perfectly fine. Now you go like, okay, yeah, perfectly fine. Should I do anything? I, my potential, you know, if an 84 year old walks in and says, I'm perfectly normal, what are you going to say? I'm going to make you better? They're going to be like, I'm already better. You know, and we can cause them to have a stroke. We can cause a vascular complication. We can cause them to have a pacemaker. So how do you justify doing a TAVR on somebody who's asymptomatic, leading their life? They are not going to be running on, you know, treadmills or going to the gym, but they are happy and they are contented. Most of the time you can say, okay, you know, if something happens, these are the symptoms, come back. That is most of the time. But some of the times you see an echo with the, although they are asymptomatic, but their LV is going down. That means their heart is failing. As of yet, they have not developed the symptoms. This would be the time to intervene on them. Sometimes what you can do is on the C1 asymptomatic, people who are normal, you can put them on a treadmill. I know it's dangerous, physician has to be there. And what you are looking for is, you know, they do a little bit of walking and they cannot walk. They are just blowing wind when they say, you know, I, I can do everything, I feel like they cannot. And, or secondly, their blood pressure drops. If the blood pressure drops, it's an ominous sign. You can always make the case, hey, you get off the treadmill, you're gonna get you a tavern sooner than later. I, we understand that. Then you can explain to the patient and they can go from there. All right, but then comes the D uh, classification, which is a go, 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 get that done as soon as you possibly can. And uh, I think I'll skip this, uh, which is going into the subsets of D, D1, D2, D3. Um, this is, but I just wanted to, this is the current recommendation. I just wanted to point this out uh, that what is, so abnormal aortic valve with reduced systolic opening symptoms due to AS. So you, somebody is having symptoms and they are having uh, issues and they have severe more than four mean gradient above 40, you can do whatever needs to be done. Either they need surgery or TAVR, that is as simple as it gets. Somebody is symptomatic with aortic stenosis, you can go ahead and get the surgery done. Now, no symptoms, that's where I pointed out that if the EF is dropping, you can still send them for surgery because you don't want their EF to drop any further. So if it's less than other cardiac surgery, they need a bypass and don't have symptoms from the valve itself, then you can still do that. And then, as I said, you can put them on a treadmill, see if they're, what is their exercise capacity expected to be, and if they drop their blood pressure. And then the stage B is only indicated if you have any other cardiac surgery going on. So. This is just, a, again, these are the recommendations uh, by the American College of Cardiology. And uh, basically, age less than 50, you know, it becomes a challenging thing because people still come in and say, hey, we want a tower because, but if they can tolerate blood thinners and they do not have a contraindication to any, um, Coumadin or stuff like that, they should get um, a mechanical valve, all right? And if there are contraindications, their life expectancy is short. They cannot take uh, because of their job. That is the most important thing. Or if they have had a bleeding problem before, bleeding from ulcers, whatever, you know, and they are, there's a contraindication to giving them Coumadin, then you say, okay, we can do, and you know, I go to some of these meetings where they are talking of crazy. It sounds crazy. They say, well, you do a TAVR, then you bring, uh, when they hit 60, then you bring them back for a SAVR, and then you go TAVR, TAVR again. You know, it's crazy. But that is, you know, the thought leaders are thinking, okay, 
you can do this multiple times. Why? Because you can, if you have a tissue valve, you can put another tissue valve in there without compromising the size. You have to realize about, I think, 30 years ago, there was a paper out in Mayo Clinic, um, uh, which pointed out absolutely that all the people who get 19 millimeter valves, these uh, small little ladies, we are not doing them any service whatsoever. They will probably die in the same amount of time as uh, if you had not done anything for them. And this is still the case. I do not put, you, I showed you the sizes of these valves starting from the 20. I do not put in a 20 millimeter valve. They'd never do well. Bigger is better in this case. So believe it or not, 20 millimeter valve is not going to work for anybody. There is a phenomena known as patient prosthesis mismatch, which means even though you put it, they are not going to do well. So we have not the supraannular valve, which I showed you, which I put in all these small uh, ladies or people or men or whatever you say. This you can put in a bigger valve. So you, the valve which actually measures, the annulus which actually measures 20 millimeters, you can put a 26 or a 29 millimeter valve in that. And if you talk to a surgeon who has been doing these surgeries for eons, and they look at it and they say, I have never heard of a 29 millimeter valve. How can you do this? You know, Because for a 29 or a 26 valve, they have to do aortic root reconstruction. They have to open up the root, they, and that makes it challenging, high risk, and there are not many surgeons who are willing to do that. So the recommendations right now, where we stand, and this make, it's obviously a fluid field as the technology improves, the uh, operator experience improves, we are going to see the recommendations change. Anybody above 65, if they want a tower, and there are no other contraindications, they can get it. So surgery and TAVR are both the same level of evidence, except for people who are younger and they need a mechanical valve. All right, so. So here we go. This is in patients over 65 years of age who require AVR, it's reasonable to choose a bioprosthesis over a mechanical valve. So 65, as you hit that age, you can, choose and I will, but this is the same thing what I was talking about early as with AS, all of them, except for the people age. If they are younger, they get a uh, mechanical, otherwise all of them can get uh, a surgical, bioprosthetic and or a tablet valve. All right, so I think, um, so these are the things which you can keep in mind. But as I said, you know, it's becoming more and more difficult to convince the patient one way or the other because they read up on it before they come. They are Google doctors by the time they hit the valve clinic. Um, so far, I think the biggest thing is a lot of calcium. If Let's say if you have everybody, if a patient comes to you, 65 years of age, can have TAVR or a SAVR. And he says, doc, you tell me what I need. Okay. And you do the CT scan, they have good access. Everything looks all right. So if they have calcified aorta, which happens a lot of times, surprisingly, they are not good, good candidates for surgical valves. On the other hand, if they have a very abnormal looking annulus, that means it is uh, elongated and has a lot of calcium, which is dripping down into the uh, LV, that means they are going to have more paravalvular leak and more likely that they are going to cause uh, a conduction abnormality and uh, because that calcium is going to press on the bundle, especially if it's on that side. So these are the things which obviously the patients don't know. And when you look at it and you say, okay, you know what, this is what is good for you that you should have surgery. And why is it good? Then you can explain it to them. And most people are reasonable in the sense that they understand and they say, okay, well, we'll do this. So where we go from here, everywhere. This is what the trials are going on. We are lucky to be part of these trials. We have been doing it and we are still doing them. We are putting in mitral clips. We were part of that trial when it started. Now it's approved, it's commercially available. And now we have a mitral valve 
where we stand today. We are putting in mitral valves percutaneously. It's again in a trial. We have uh, tricuspid valves, we have tricuspid clips, we have pulmonic valves, we have. So where are we going with all of this? This is in all probability going to be, you know, 70, 80% percutaneous, 20%. Um, there are still going to be caveats where patients are going to be better off with surgery, but not right now, but there are a lot of trials going on and uh, we are dealing with this thing. All right. Anybody up to the challenge of answering a few questions? I thought there were going to be students over here. I'm seriously disappointed. All right. All right. In asymptomatic patients with severe AS, C1, they are asymptomatic. Exercise testing, oh crap. I cannot handle my own questions. Exercise testing is reasonable to assess physiological changes with exercise and to confirm the absence of symptoms. True, false. True, yeah. In symptomatic patients with severe D1, velocity above four meter per second and or mean pressure gradient 40 millimeters of mercury, exercise testing should not be performed because of the risk of severe hemodynamic compromise. True, excellent. As patients at risk of developing AS, stage A, Patients with asymptomatic AS, B and C, hypertension should be treated according to the standard GDMT started at a lower dose and gradually titrated upwards with appropriate clinical monitoring. True, all right? Because yes, they, they are the same risk factors, what you are going to develop over a period of time. And uh, uh, these are all... Uh, Statin therapy, this is false. In patients with calcific AS, stage B and C, statin therapy is not indicated for prevention of hemodynamic progression of AS. That is false. You should treat them. Again, the same risk factors for coronary disease is the risk factor for uh, aortic stenosis. There's a long question at the end, but I'll forego it. All right, we are going to have questions at the end. I think my time is up. All right, thank you guys. I think you're each individually mic'd, so uh, if you not, the pointer is at the very tip of that, like right here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's an honor to be here. I uh, appreciate the invitation from uh, Dr. Sam to uh, visit with you today. Um, before we start, I do have one serious apology. Uh, sometime in the last week, I realized that I left out the most important slide in my presentation. Uh, in my entire career, I think every talk that I've ever given, I started out with a far side cartoon. And I have no far side cartoon today, so I apologize. Um, so, ready to go forward? Great. Um, Dr. Ghani really already alluded to this. Um, there's truly a revolution uh, going on in cardiology. Um, so, oh. No disclosures. Uh, I own no industry stock. Um, this is what interventional cardiology was for about 35 years. It's a carotid artery, it's a SFA, it's a coronary artery. You put a wire, you put a balloon, maybe you put a stent. That's what interventional cardiology was for 35 years. Until this event. Uh, Dr. Ghani, I'm sure, has seen these pictures before. They've been shown at uh, numerous meetings. Uh, this is Alain Cribier in uh, Rouen, France. Uh, 2002, the first TAVR performed. Uh, so there he is with an awake patient, valve replacement under conscious sedation. Um, and like all good Frenchmen, they celebrated uh, about 15 minutes later with a glass of champagne. Um, and so was born the uh, structural revolution. Um, and Dr. Ghani also spoke about this, the prevalence of valvular heart disease goes up astronomically with the aging population. So the demographics in the United States are driving valvular heart disease. Um, heart attacks still occur. People still come to the ER with STEMIs. But if you look at the STEMI per 65-year-old number or the STEMI per 70-year-old number, it's down. Um, and you know we used to do three STEMIs a day every day. Um, and we still do them, but in smaller numbers. There's nothing changing the onslaught of valvular heart disease coming our direction. Um, and uh, this is all valvular disease. 
Uh, aortic disease is what Dr. Ghani has been treating, talking about. But mitral valvular disease is the uh, uh, sort of redheaded stepchild um, because solutions or mitral valvular disease are harder, more challenging, and have come along later. But if anything, mitral valvular disease is more common than aortic valvular disease even. Uh, so this is really the next pandemic. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about is the other valve, and we're going to talk about uh, transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair. So the new acronym is TEER, T-E-E-R. Uh, many of you have probably uh, heard the term mitriclip. I, let me just ask, uh, I, I bet this will be a, a high number. How many of you in practice have had a patient undergoing either a TAVR or a mitriclip procedure? Most of the room. Um, so you're all familiar with the outcomes. Uh, it's just been a mind boggling journey and it's been so fast. The developments have, have come so quickly in iterations. Uh, the FDA has really worked well with these companies to get new technology in our hands. So this is the concept of the MitraClip device. Uh, there was a surgical approach to mitral regurgitation, which was a very simplistic approach. Uh, an Italian surgeon named Alfieri invented this surgery, which is simply put two stitches on the central portion of the mitral valve and you can create a double barrel orifice. Very simplistic, not terribly elegant, but in a fair number of patients, it was effective. Uh, so somebody said, well, we should be able to do that with a catheter. And here's one of the early drawings uh, before the thing ever came off of an assembly line. And so the concept is go up from the right atrium, from the femoral vein, do a transeptal puncture, and use this clip device to capture the leaflets and basically recreate the Alfieri surgery. That's transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair. Um, and just for fun, I'll highlight something that probably nobody noticed. Look who used to be a real doctor. Um, before he was a nutraceutical salesman, uh, Dr. Oz really was uh, an amazing surgeon. Um, in a former life, I was a transplant doctor, heart failure program, I went to the transplant meetings. Dr. Oz was a bad surgeon uh, at Columbia. Uh, and he would present papers. He was a real doctor back then, um, amazingly enough, um, enough politics. Um, so here's the device uh, in a fairly current iteration. Uh, so it's this really um, uh, somewhat intimidating device uh, on the back table. And all of this is simply so that you can steer. So this allows us to basically steer in 3D space. Uh, and here at the end of that catheter is a clip. Uh, so again, we get across the mitral valve, here's the regurgitant jet, and you leave a clothespin. Uh, I tell my patients, it's like putting a clothespin on your mitral valve. Uh, so that's what it looks like. Just a little bit of background may be helpful. Um, we as a cardiology community have a problem with nomenclature with regard to mitral regurgitation. We also have a problem with um, accuracy of measurement. Um, there are things I tell patients that we can measure very precisely. Uh, if you have a brain tumor and we get an MRI, we can tell you within a millimeter how big that lesion is. Um, aortic stenosis, we're not perfect, but we do pretty darn well in terms of assessing mild, moderate, or severe. Mitral regurgitation is much more challenging. There are numbers we can put on it. There are numbers like regurgitant fraction, regurgitant orifice area, and they're helpful. They're far from perfect. We desperately need better ways to quantify the severity of mitral regurgitation. Actually, cardiac MR is pretty good, uh, but isn't widely used, but increasingly available. Um, but we also have this nomenclature. The American Society of Echocardiography says there's only three categories, mild, moderate, or severe. But then there's this term that leaks in, which is moderate to severe. Well, what does that mean? American Society of Echo says this doesn't even exist. And then there's this one plus two plus three plus four plus. For what it's worth, moderate to severe and three plus sort of equate, but you get a feeling for how subjective this is sometimes. It's just an imperfect system. And the reason for bringing this up is all of the previous guidelines for mitral surgery, when that was all we had, mitral repair surgery, say severe. If it's not severe, you don't do it. But the literature on MitraClip from the very beginning included moderate to severe or three plus. I'm not gonna show you the flow chart to define what the EROA is for moderate to severe, but suffice it to say, and you'll see echo reports depending on the echo reader, 
you'll see some stuff and it may be hard for you to interpret, but recognize that everything I'm gonna show you includes people with severe and moderate to severe or three plus. Um, so that's a little bit of background. Um, the aortic valve is a lot more common. Oh, I didn't realize this was a video. I thought that was a still frame. Um, so um, it's a lot more complicated structure than the aortic valve, which is why it's taken longer to develop things. Um, uh, I will tell you that, uh, and Dr. Argani uh, and I might hate to admit this in other spheres, doing a TAVR has gotten 90% of the time pretty standard, pretty simple. Uh, it's literally a 40 minute procedure from the time you slap your gloves on until you're done. And they're, they're almost always pretty reproducible. Um, the mitral valve is just more complex. Um, although stuff is getting better in the mitral's place. But there are all these cords, uh, the leaflets are different sizes, the posterior leaflet, the anterior, it's a more complicated structure than the aortic valve. Um, and in addition, there are different diseases. So aortic stenosis, there's bicuspid valves and earlier, but 95% of what we deal with is senile calcific aortic stenosis. It's the same disease every time, pretty much. The mitral valve, there are different things that affect the mitral valve, and we divide them into two categories. Um, so primary or degenerative mitral valve, it's a valve problem. Um, so by and large, this is myxomatous disease, mitral valve prolapse. Uh, or in older patients, a ruptured cord that may not be associated with myxomatous disease, but it's a valve problem. The ventricle is normal or fine. Um, on the other hand, secondary or functional mitral regurgitation, the problem starts in the ventricle. The valve is structurally normal, but it gets distorted by the dysfunctional ventricle, um, which is shown sort of here. So here's portrayal of a normal uh, mitral valve and the mitral valve is suspended by these chordal structures. You know, they only drew one of the two papillary muscles. I don't know why, um, but that suspension is part of what makes the mitral valve uh, co-apt well and seal. Um, but when you've got, in this example, um, a posterior scar on your heart, then that muscle doesn't come in and those cords remain stretched out here. So the leaflet isn't allowed to come down and close. So that's chordal tethering. Um, and in addition, as you all know, as the left ventricle becomes more dysfunctional, as the ejection fraction goes down, the ventricle enlarges. And so the combination of this chordal tethering and the annulus starts widening out and the valve doesn't meet. I tell patients it's sort of like this normal, mitral valve is a little bit like a teepee and you've got this nice seal zone where two leaflets come together. As the ventricle dilates, it flattens, and there just isn't much meeting space. So that's functional mitral regurgitation. So again, we're really dealing with multiple diseases in two broad categories when we're talking about the mitral valve. Um, so here's this vicious cycle of mitral regurgitation. LV dysfunction, dilation of the ventricle, tethering of the cords leads to regurgitation, which in turn, leads to volume overload. Uh, when you're sending 50% of your blood back into the atrium, and if you need five liters a minute out in the body, the ventricle has to pump 10 liters a minute to get you your five liter cardiac output. That's volume overload, which causes the ventricle to dilate further, which worsens mitral regurgitation. So it's uh, a vicious circle, a self-reinforcing phenomenon. Um, so with that background, here's the original mitral clip paper, uh, 2011. Um, not that long ago, that's 11 years ago, first uh, randomized trial of mitriclip device. Um, and this was a combination of degenerative or primary mitrogurgitation and functional or secondary. So you see the randomization curves. This is five year free from death or repeat mitral valve intervention. And what you can see is the clip pretty much fares the same as surgery. Um, and this is an early device. This is first generation device. Pretty amazing results for uh, that trial at that period of time. And that led to FDA approval. But interestingly, the FDA said, we're gonna approve it here for primary mitral regurgitation. It was not a peer approved for this. And the reason wasn't that, gee, we're, we're not sure it did as well as surgery. The reason was that even surgery unproven for this disease. Surgery is proven to be beneficial for primary mitral valvular disease. 
not clear that either one does a whole lot for functional, at least in this time frame. So the FDA said, we're going to prove mitral clip, but only for primary mitral valvular disease. Um, and that results in these guidelines. So here's primary mitral regurgitation. Um, and if they're symptomatic and you have severe MR, surgery first, and then only if they're high risk, um, then you can offer them a mitral clip. And this is a current guideline and that's the current state of the art. So if you have somebody with ruptured cord, mitral valve prolapse, severe MR, first therapy is surgery if their valve is amenable and if the patient's a candidate. If they're deemed high risk by a surgeon who's seen them, then they can be offered mitral clip if their anatomy is amenable. So primary mitral regurgitation, surgery first, um, tier second, only if they're not a candidate. So that's all intro. Here's really the topic of my talk. Talk, um, And this is a change in the last three years. Um, actually, maybe four now. Um, so uh, functional or secondary MR, what do we know about it? Uh, so surgery for functional MR, really no good data. This was a, a trial from the CTSN. Um, and this was people undergoing cabbage who had mitral regurgitation and they were randomized to either replacement or repair. Um, it's not fix the valve versus medical therapy, but it's replacement versus repair. And there's very little difference, but most importantly, this was the first time we ever had serial echocardiographic follow-up of a large number of patients who got mitral surgery. So it, it just hasn't been part of the surgeon world. In all these TAVR studies, it's baked into the trial at the start. These people are gonna get an echo at six months and one year and da, da, da. That's never been the surgical word. This is literally, when, what year was this? I don't have it. Uh, this isn't that long ago. This may be five years ago. The first time that we had long-term data on what's the outcome of mitral regurgitation. So look at this number. These are surgical mitral repairs, which we think of as the gold standard. 58% of the people who got a surgical repair had moderate or severe MR at two years. Um, and this is functional MR. This is not the degenerative. This is not the mitral valve prolapse. But it's these we're talking about today. 58% recurrent significant MR. Um, and then this is another trial. This is the only randomized trial of surgical mitral repair versus medical therapy. And it was a relatively small trial, again, in people who were undergoing cabbage for coronary disease. They had reduced EF, they had functional mitral regurgitation, and cabbage versus cabbage plus mitral repair, zero difference. So based on those two studies, I know it's a lot of data, not a lot of data, but that's, there, there isn't always a lot of randomized trial going on in the surgical sphere. Um, and so that the only data we have is negative for surgery for functional mitral regurgitation, secondary MR. Surgery just doesn't have any data to set its benefits. So that brings us to the title of the talk. Uh, this is the Titanic. Um, and what people have said for many years about function mitral regurgitation, largely based on the surgical type of data that I just showed you, is this. The titanic view of functional uh, of intervention for functional MR is the disease is the ventricle. They've got a sick ventricle. It's going to progress. Um, and fixing that mitral regurgitation in somebody who has an EF of 30%, it's like rearranging the deck chairs. The ship's gone down. Don't bother. It's not going to help people. Uh, and that's based on the surgical trials. And that leads us to this. Um, so uh, this study came out in 2018. Uh, I was in San Diego at the meetings when this was presented. Were you there that year, Dr. Ghani? Were you in the auditorium? Yep, we were. What an amazing, what an amazing day that was. Were you part of uh, Cohab? Uh, uh, yeah. Part of this trial and the average trial. Yeah, I thought you might've been. Um, this was an amazing day. This is the most amazing study um, I've seen in my however many years as an interventional cardiologist, I thought this study was gonna be negative. I had a little bit of that Titanic view. I don't know what your thought was. I thought this was gonna be a negative trial. So this was about 600 patients, significant mitral regurgitation, CLIP versus medical therapy only. Um, so here's the data. Uh, this is two-year data, and this is mortality or heart hot failure hospitalization, 44% reduction with mitral clip compared to medical therapy alone, look at the number of zeros on that p-value. You don't see that very often. And this is three-year data. Actually, the five-year data was just published a few weeks ago. I didn't have a chance to put it in, um, but it's still out at three years. This is a 52% reduction in 
heart failure or medical therapy in uh, heart failure hospitalization or mortality uh, with CLIP versus medical therapy alone. Um, pretty amazing. Uh, not only did it improve those hard outcomes, quality of life improves markedly, six minute walk improves. Um, and now look at this, I just showed you, whoops, where did I go? There, I just showed you that 58% recurrence in the surgical literature. This is three year data on the mitra clip. 1.2% had significant mitra regurgitation. So most people have mild one plus two plus MR. It's a durable procedure. So it's durable and amazing outcomes. This puts it in perspective against medical therapy. So these are the mortality reductions. So this is mortality, ACE inhibitors 16%, uh, Entresto 32%, beta blockers 36%, 42% reduction with uh, tier. So uh, actually I was just at some meetings uh, last week. Um, there's a Dr. Reisman who Dr. Ghani would know, um, who's been a big mitra clip guy. And he says it's no longer GDMT, it's GDMT-T, GDMT plus tier if you're a candidate. Um, so approved by the FDA 2019, it's in the guidelines, I won't walk through that. Um, and importantly, unlike degenerative MR, um, tier is a treatment for secondary MR, it's the first choice if they fail maximal medical therapy, it's not just if they're not a good surgical candidate. So this is the treatment of choice for moderate to severe or severe mitral regurgitation in people uh, with uh, cardiomyopathy and secondary MR. So a few key points I wanna mention. We tend to wait until people are sicker. Um, the point here is this is dividing up the COAP study into patients with class three or four advanced heart failure versus class two heart failure. So class two is somebody who says, yeah, I can go walk a couple of three blocks. If you ask Mrs. Jones, somebody with class two heart failure in your office, are you short of breath? She'll say no. You may figure it out if you ask her, okay, how far can you walk before you have to stop? You may figure it out. Class two patients, they don't sound very sick, but even class two patients benefit. So this red group, uh, the higher, this is medical therapy and this is tier, but look at the people with class two. 64% versus 40%. Uh, that is a 46% reduction, even in the class two patients. So in the class two patients, TIER offers a 46% reduction in death or heart failure hospitalization, 45% in death and improved quality of life. Um, so that's study data. What about in the real world? This slide is just to show you there's a lot of these being done. I don't have more recent numbers, 10,000 done in 2019. Those numbers are growing, so I'm sure it's 15,000 or something nationwide each year now. Uh, that's the national registry. Whoop. Um, the in-hospital mortality, now this is the registry going back, so this is, includes a lot of older folks, 2% in-hospital mortality, but I'm gonna show you more current real-world data. And this number is quality of life. Many people may not know, this is a questionnaire, the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire. It's a survey for quality of life questions. A five point difference in KCCQ is considered meaningful in terms of we did something favorable for this patient. This is national data from the TBT registry, 20 point improvement in quality of life scores. Uh, so these people benefit, that's real world data. So I talked to you about how rapidly the technology is moving. This is the fourth generation mitra clip now, different sizes, different lengths. Um, and now the results are even better. 98% of patients undergoing this procedure had um, less than two plus MR. So it's by and large successful. Um, they get significant quality of life improvements. Um, and look at this, this is not just in hospital mortality, this is 30 day mortality in a group of patients who underwent a valvular procedure with EFs of 30, 35%. 30 day mortality of 1.3%, that's probably an in hospital mortality below 1%. So it's a very safe and effective procedure. Um, so here's a case that we did uh, a few months ago, 84 year old male, uh, previous MI, cabbage, advanced heart failure, class 3B. He was short of breath walking from his bedroom to the kitchen. He was on the usual characters. CF wasn't horrific, it was 41%. Um, although if you have severe MR, that's a worse ventricle than you'd think. Huge regurgitant volume. Um, 
And so I thought I'd show you a, uh, a case. Uh, so you can see there's this jet of mitral regurgitation. Um, that's the 3D view. This is looking down from the life atrium into the mitral valve. That's the anterior and the posterior leaflet. And so this is the septum. This is us doing a transeptal puncture. And there's the clip. So amazingly, everything else we do in the cath lab, it's all x-ray, step on the floor of pedal. We step on the floor of pedal very little during these procedures. It's all TE driven. Um, so here's the clip. We're above the valve. We're about to drive down across it. We've now grasped the leaflet, and you can already see reduction in the mitral gurge. So that's the first clip. In a different view, there was still some residual leakage. So here's a second clip going in next to the first. And this is a final result compared to that giant jet uh, that was way back here. Uh, I'll skip, I won't go back. So this guy, literally that night, he walked two laps on the floor. So these people get amazing symptomatic results. So that's where we've been. Um, it's it's uh, appropriate that the device is called the mitra clip. So the studies that I've shown you had very restrictive anatomic criteria. I won't go through the details, but all studies, whether it's a hypertensive, you restrict your patient population so that you're more likely to get good result. But once they get in Tresto out there, people are going to use it here and they're going to use it there. Same is true of the mitra clip. So um, uh, like MacGyver's paper clip, the mitra clip has increasingly been used in other sets. So I've just got three data points uh, or three categories here, and we may not make it through all of them. So these are the anatomic criteria from the original Everest trial. I won't go through what those mean. Um, but this is data from the G4 registry. Um, and 30% of the patients now getting clipped um, are outside those bounds of the original anatomic criteria. And yet, even with this anatomic complexity, 3% had significant MR, 97% got a great result. Uh, there's a new entity or newly appreciated entity called atrial, mitri uh, atrial functional mitral regurgitation. Most functional MR is because of ventricular dilation. Turns out there's an entity where AFib, different things, people get left atrial dilation. Doesn't matter from which side you dilate the annulus, you get MR. Uh, and I'll skip through those slides for some time. Um, and then finally, um, recently people have been pushing the boundaries. There's a data set out there for mitral regurgitation and people with full-blown shock, people on pressors, people on ECMO, um, and a fraction of those people can be salvaged with a mitral clip device. So this is a retrospective study looking at people where mitral clip was attempted in cardiogenic shock and it was a little bit less successful. So it was only successful 85% of the time but if you had a successful procedure, it markedly improved your survival. Um, there's a whole world of new devices. There are new clip devices, new tier devices. Not surprisingly, they look a lot like the mitral clip. Um, but there's a whole slew of other technologies coming for the mitral valve. And again, I just came back from these meetings. It's mind boggling what's coming down the pipe. Um, and beyond those devices, there are transcatheter mitral valve replacements. Um, are you guys in any of the TMVR trials? Which device are you guys using? Uh -huh. Great. Um, so there's a whole world of these devices that begin to look more like tapper, where we're actually going to go across the septum and drop a new valve in the mitral valve. So there's amazing stuff coming out. Um, so transcatheter edge to edge repair is now the standard of care and has been demonstrated improved survival, decrease heart failure admissions, improve quality of life, improve functional capacity, six minute walk and reverse remodeling. And that is that. And we'll move directly into our third lecture. I think we'll transfer. Doug yes, sir. Get to my stuff somewhere here. Oh, I don't recognize any of those. There we go. Well, my name is Cody Jewell. I am cardiac electrophysiologist at Oklahoma Heart Hospital South. 
I have the unenviable task of covering all of non-pharmacologic management of AFib in a 30 minute time slot. So get ready because we're going to go. Uh, I will warn you though, I gave this lecture to my wife last night in practice and she only made it through about half of the slides and she was sawing logs. So if you, if you fall asleep, I won't hold it against you. I have no disclosures. I'm not uh, in anybody's pocket right now. I am for sale though, right? So Journal of AFib says that atrial fibrillation is a highly prevalent rhythm, uh, heart rhythm dis disturbance often associated with underlying cardiovascular disease. Due to this, the management of AFib is often complex and current practice calls for more comprehensive multifactorial and patient-centered approach. We'll kind of tear into that a little bit. So most common chronic arrhythmia defined by the ECG findings are our interval and P wave or absence thereof, and it is an irregular rhythm. In AFib, you know, normally we have this very synchronized uh, cardiac function where a signal propagates from the SA node, follows a couple of pathways in the right side of the heart, one over to the left through Bachmann's bundle, uh, down to the AV node in this nice, beautiful, synchronized rhythm. But in AFib, I, I tell my patients, AFib is like having 10 six-year-olds in the room and it's just mass chaos. I have a seven-year-old and he's shot out of a cannon. I can only imagine what it'd be like with 10 of them, right? And so that's kind of what AFib looks like, this very chaotic uh, rhythm uh, that leading to this irregular heart rhythm. ECG features rapid and irregular fibrillatory waves, 350 to 600 beats per minute, and the heart functions look like a bag of worms. Um, these patients are chronic, comorbid, and complex. And those are really hard to see, aren't they up there? But um, it's a progressive disorder. We'll talk about the progression, a little more requiring comprehensive treatment plans. Patient pathways are often nonlinear and require timely diagnosis and management. We'll kind of speak on that a little bit. Comorbidities, there's often multiple things going on in these patients uh, leading to AFib, either as a primary or a secondary diagnosis. The treatment strategies vary based on who gets to the patient first. Uh, oftentimes it's the, uh, the plumbers over here. And, and so then we get to them late. Uh, I gave a lecture a year ago at a, a TCT with mostly plumbers. And I told them, I said, don't worry about it. I'll speak slow for everybody will understand what I'm saying. Uh, the complex patients uh, with a lot of different specialties, therapies and influences here. And these often get fallen through the cracks and lost. There's multiple risk factors for AFib. The biggest, of course, in, in my population is the stroke of sleep apnea. Roughly 80% of patients with sleep apnea will have an atrial arrhythmia. And I tell my patients when I walk in the room knowing they have AFib, if I just tell them they have sleep apnea, I'm right as much as I'm wrong. It's about 50% in that population. Obesity, heart failure, coronary disease, those type of things, alcohol consumption can happen in some patients where it can become directly toxic to the heart, leading to these processes. And then, of course, valvular disease, which these guys have mentioned, can certainly worsen uh, AFib. AFib leads to a 47% reduction in the quality of life with heightened anxiety, burnout, and a decreased mental uh, health. These patients are five times more likely to have a stroke, five times more likely to have heart failure and 46% greater risk of death. Interesting, uh, you know, Dr. Ghani's slide earlier talked about some of the mortality here and the numbers are vastly different. So I'm not sure which textbook we got our numbers out of, but it definitely wasn't the same, right? Uh, in, but the point is in AFib, uh, at five year survival is only about 51%. Tells you, you know, it's kind of a very sobering, thought there that when a patient comes in with a new diagnosis of AFib, half of them will be dead in five years. And in 15 months of, of an AFib patient, they'll see th be in the emergency department three times, uh, have 12 outpatient hospital visits and 67 physician encounters. By 2030, the population expected to grow to around 12, 12 million people, leading to 450,000 hospitalizations per year. $8,700 a patient uh, above their, their cohorts, leading to 564,000 hospital visits with 65% of those leading to admission and costing the U.S. taxpayers uh, $26 billion a year. Presently, our population is somewhere around 8 million people, and of that, about 45% or 3.6 million have a long-standing persistent 
uh, atrial fibrillation. Causes of AFib, this is a very busy slide. It's one of those that when I was in medical school and residency, I would cringe when I saw it because of all this stuff happening. But the punchline really is this atrial structural abnormalities. It's fed by these extra cardiac factors, the hypertension, obesity, uh, hyperthyroidism, alcohol, drugs, sleep apnea, those things leading to remodeling that occurs in the wall of the heart and the fibrosis, dilatation, ischemia. Those can be accelerated by certain genetic conditions, uh, SCN5A being the most uh, likely one. That leads to atrial remodeling and activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, leading to further atrial uh, electrical abnormalities, which feed back into this whole mechanism. Atrial fibrillation is classified as paroxysmal, meaning last uh, less than seven days, persistent beyond seven days and requiring uh, conversion, whether that be with chemical or electrical cardioversion. Long-standing persistent, more than 12 months and permanent, which means they're no longer, uh, okay, I didn't see that. I don't know if that's for me or somebody else, but for, uh, permanent meaning where it stays any longer than, and rate control is no, or rhythm control is no longer available. From the per first episode of AFib, there's progression from uh, to recurrent AFib in about 19 months, year and a half, by three years to persistent AFib and permanent in about four years. And 20% of patients will go from paroxysmal AFib to persistent AFib within their first year. So AFib is clearly a progressive disorder uh, where you have this scarring leading to in stretching and further stiffening then feeds on itself. And I use the, the uh, statement of AFib begets AFib uh, from the Bible, right? It begets such and such. And so AFib begets AFib. What we have early in, in paroxysmal AFib, we have ectopic foci or triggers in the pulmonary veins or in the, the substrate itself in some cases. But as you develop persistent AFib, you see more, more fibrosis in the muscle uh, leading to uh, scarring and things that propagate or continue the AFib. And then as you continue into advanced stages of AFib, longstanding persistent, which used to be a chronic AFib uh, diagnosis, uh, you see this more fibrosis takes over into the wall. <clears throat> In talking about AFib and kind of why people have AFib, it's important to understand that the heart doesn't beat like a bellows. It's not squeezing like what we would think of the heart, you know, squeezing the walls coming together. It's a torsional energy and that the muscle fibers uh, lay in a crisscross fashion. So if you're taking the heart, it's tethered in place by the pulmonary veins and you're grabbing it and twisting it with every heartbeat around 100,000 times a, a, a day. And so if you'd imagine all the tension that would occur in those, in those pulmonary veins and vasculature, that tethering uh, from the veins here leads to this torsional energy and scarring. And so what you get is this, this stretch leading to inflammation, which leads to fibrosis, which propagates more AFib, leading to more stretch, inflammation, fibrosis. And so it just becomes this, this system that feeds on itself. Things that increase wall tension in the atrium, like a sleep apnea, a hypertension, valvular disease, those would lead to more stretch, more inflammation, more fibrosis. The posterior wall becomes more and more important as the, the AFib progresses in the treatment. So we have this uh, disorganized electrical impulses through the heart that we need to correct. And the mechanisms, you have triggering mechanisms and you have me mechanisms that perpetuate or prolong the AFib. The triggered mechanisms typically are focal in that you can have uh, firing from the uh, pulmonary veins or even from uh, ganglionic plexi, which are the green. Or this is a term that makes everybody cringe when you hear it because it's kind of fallen out of vogue here, but this micro reentry, which leads to propagation or uh, perpetuation of the rhythm over here, the term was called rotors. People have kind of shown maybe that doesn't really exist. So we really kind of go back to using micro reentry. Mechanisms of initiation, and that actually used to fire off and show a little uh, kind of cute little firing, but it doesn't right now, I guess. But you have this firing that occurs inside the pulmonary vein, electrical activity then propagates into the posterior wall, 
where it hits this scarring and causes multiple uh, wavefront reentries or micro reentry. Things that can lead to more remodeling, atrial dilatation and uh, decreased in atrial refractoriness would lead to more remodeling. And so the more remodeling, the more uh, micro reentry leading to more remodeling. Just to make sure that uh, guys like me don't just get this easy, the wall of the heart isn't homogeneous. It's this very complex uh, interwoven uh, bands of, of muscle tissue. And so you can have epicardial bridging uh, from inside the pulmonary veins to the posterior wall. And so just when you think I got this and get all these pulmonary veins isolated, what you see is it's firing inside the vein. That's just jumping epicardial. So you have to do one step further, go find where these epicardial bridges are at and try to isolate those. So my job isn't easy in other words, right? Why treat AFib? Stroke is around 5% per year. Uh, LV dysfunction from uh, the, the rapid heartbeats and stuff can lead to heart failure and myocardial ischemia. Options include medications, cardioversion, catheter ablation. Uh, hybrid ablation is kind of why, what I'm more known for right here. Um, and we'll talk about more on that. And then the left atrial appendage management has become something of, of late to discuss. And I'll have some slides talking about endocardial approaches there. Surgical ablation in the maze procedure by uh, James Cox from uh, WashU, uh, now over 20, or right around, yeah, a little over 20 years ago. And then device pace, pace therapies in pacemaker and ILRs. It's important to get to these patients early. When we see that uh, the success rates, oh, and my arrow somehow got moved from, so that's the arrow, it should have been pointing to that line, sorry. It looks like, uh, somewhere and moving the slides over, that arrow has gotten shifted. Uh, but obviously, the sooner you get to these patients, the better off they are in the long run. But I can tell you, most of the time, I'm not seeing patients 30 to 180 days of their diagnosis. I'm seeing them out after they've been sitting there for four or five years. This question of rate versus rhythm control has been one that's gone on for 20 plus years. Uh, and it really dates all the way back in 2001, where we had this class three guideline for ablation. Uh, we didn't want to know about, you know, kind of ablation was in its infancy. There was a lot unknown about rhythm control. A firm data came out in 2002 saying maybe it didn't really matter, but obviously there were some issues there, how they maintain rhythm control and, and then body count issues. So they had a the, the randomization there, they got unlucky, had more, more pa patients in the um, rhythm control arm that had lung cancer. And so that shifted the numbers a little bit. And so when you extrapolate for some of that, the question then became, maybe there is something to this rhythm control. So studies were done showing uh, rhythm control had an associated reduction in death. And so in around 2006, catheter ablation became a class 2A uh, indication. Further studies have led to it now being class one indication and has maintained that for about eight years now. Progression of, of rhythm and versus rate control. So if you, in rhythm control patients, you clearly see a progression of their AFib from, uh, uh, from paroxysmal to persistent on to permanent. That's slowed in a rhythm control group. And when you look at ablation versus medicines, it's clear that a catheter ablation is strongly uh, better at, at, at stopping the progression of AFib than drug therapy. And in catheter ablation, we see this mortality stroke, or excuse me, mortality, heart failure, stroke, and dementia are all lower uh, post ablation, with the only exception really being this heart failure uh, might not be statistically different. We'll see. But certainly here, you're actually better to have had AFib and had an ablation than you were to have no AFib in most of these categories, oddly enough. And catheter ablation results in improvement in quality of life with a reduction in symptom frequency and severity. Some different options here for catheter ablation. Uh, when I was in uh, residency, right around 2000 and two, I guess it was, I was uh, right around there. 
uh, I was in a meeting. I started off in family medicine. I'm sitting in a meeting, you know, this arrhythmia for the primary care, and they were presenting this information about catheter ablation. It was very early into that, and um, and so I was looking at that and watching it, just kind of fascinated. I got up and I knew I was supposed to be an electrician. So there's some some progression of how we approach catheter ablation, and I better hurry up here. So early on, the catheter ablation dealt with these, these pulmonary vein signals. So they would go out and find focal signals in the pulmonary veins and ablate them. But unfortunately, what happens here is this is a stenosis in a pulmonary vein. So when you get down into the vein itself and ablate, you cause pulmonary vein stenosis. And so that quickly became where we didn't want to do that much longer. And so those signals there firing off. And then the next step was a segmental uh, ablation where we'd put a lasso catheter down in the os of the vein and you'd burn sequentially around that in this type of fashion here. Let's get through those to there. And so what we'd do is take your ablation catheter and you'd find, you know, if that was the, the earliest signal, you'd start there. And then you'd look at the next, so the early signal just jumped over here and you'd go over there. And you do it until you had isolation. That led to pulmonary vein stenosis as well. And it requires two transeptals. And so it's one thing to get one catheter over. It's another, you know, it's completely different to get the second one. Uh, that second one comes at about seven times the mortality. So we've developed into what's called a WACA, a wide area circumferential ablation or circumferential antral pulmonary vein isolation. This can be done with a single transeptal, the goal being just completely surround the pulmonary vein with a ring of scar. I use the analogy of my patients. It's like a uh, big grass fire and you need to do a fire break. So to keep that signal inside the vein, we'd, we'd kind of cut a fire break around the grass, keep it from jumping out. There's some linear uh, left atrial ablation things that we typically do are roof line, mitral line, and in, in right-sided flutter, a cable tricuspid isthmus align. Those are used to prevent macro re-entry uh, and eliminate some non-PV fo foci. Complex flat chain electrograms, that's become some, somewhat of a, a little bit of a fad here and there. Uh, most part, I don't do cafe ablations and they don't really have great uh, literature there. Then these GP uh, sites, I'm going to kind of skip through this pretty fast, but there are a few of them that have become important. There's one right in front of the left superior pulmonary vein that you can hit, and there's one right in front of the right superior vein that becomes important. So the meat of what I need to talk about here is convergent procedure. I, uh, I've been around the convergent since its infancy. Uh, it recently re received FDA indication in persistent uh, longstanding, or excuse me, longstanding persistent uh, atrial fibrillation and it was started in a, what's called a converged trial. It was a, had six years of, of persistence. So these patients had AFib for over six years and, or right around six years on average in their uh, study. 2009 was when this started. Uh, the, the first studies or first ablations were done in Poland in 2009, March of 2009. I joined in, started doing these cases in around 2010. And uh, the cases are done either together or staged. And I started staging them about 10, ca uh, stages, 10 cases in. We had a failure of operating or the, the, the mapping system. And so I staged the case and then liked the results so much that I told the surgeon I was working with, we're just going to stage the next 10 and see what we get. And we never went back, staged all the rest of them. Now about 80% of the cases done in the, in the U.S. are staged. So they mean they have surgery case and then about six weeks later, they bring back for the EP. And so Converge trial started around 2013 and uh, was completed in about five years later, published. And then in 21, they received FDA approval. It was a superiority trial, around 153 patients. And let's see, let's try to get through some of this uh, before my time runs out and I turn into a pumpkin. So effectiveness was looked at in 65 patients, specifically 153, but they got down by the time they knocked everybody out, about 65 and 102 for safety. And the punchline is 29% reduction in AFib. And honestly, I'm surprised it's not a lot higher. Uh, in my case, the, in my patient population, I stand around a 94% one-year success rate. And I'm sitting somewhere between 80 and 85 at five years. 
palpitation, shortness of breath, uh, rest and activity, exercise tolerance, fatigue, dizziness, uh, lightheadedness, chest pain are all improved. What happens with convergent procedure is the surgical portion is done through a sub xiphoid uh, access. We come into the posterior part of the left atrium and, uh, and put around a couple of catheters here. So that's just a picture of the equipment. We'll kind of skip through some of that. Catheter is applied under suction. And this coil here uh, is an RF uh, coil. It's irrigated and they provide a 90 second ablation and they move it across in a sequential fashion across the posterior part here. And they will never be this beautiful, but you know, you kind of move it across. You typically get at least two uh, sets of, of lines across the posterior wall. And, and most men, you can get three. It'll depend on where the transverse sinus is. They usually don't get quite that high uh, and it sometimes limits. And then they won't get in front of the right and, and this left line here in front of the left inferior will get somewhere right about in there. But they only won't get up here very high. And then this will show kind of a right lesion set here uh, that never happens anymore. When they move from a, a transdiaphragmatic approach to a, a, a sub xiphoid approach, it steepens the angle. And so when you come over to try to cross in front of the right uh, atrium here, you get to this, oh, back to that, sorry. To get to these this right lines, it puts pressure on the IVC and shuts off venous return and pressure drops. So we typically don't see that line. This is what we'd hope we see, a nice posterior ablation here, some scar. So on this map, purple is alive and gray is scar. And then it follows kind of a Roy G. Biff pattern in between. And so the gray is all dead. And this would be before the epicardial portion and after the epicardial portion. Of course, this is a very cherry picked map, uh, but this is usually what I see. So the patient, this, these are two different patients. Uh, this patient was a, on the left, was an endocardial only. And so when I built my map, you can see how alive that posterior wall is. These patches of scar, of course, what caused the reentry. And here's a convergent patient. This would be a typical, uh, scarring that you would see uh, on my maps. And so that transverse sinus again keeps them from getting up, you know, on their, on their illustration, they want to show it up here closer to the superior veins than what you actually get. This is from the posterior part. I guess you all probably aren't used to seeing these maps. So you might not know what we're looking at, but uh, left superior pulmonary vein, left inferior, right superior and right inferior. And we'll skip that real quick. And the reason that the convergent uh, is, is important in my opinion is this risk of esophageal injury. Uh, about 48% MRI data, 48% of patients after a catheter ablation end up with some form of esophageal injury. About 10% of those result in ulcer formation and about one in a hundred lead to death. So that's what keeps us from being able to burn posteriorly in the, esoph or in the, in the left atrium. And with the convergent procedure, getting most of that posterior wall, that limits us uh, from having to go back there. And so the biggest culprit, about 80% of the injuries are behind the, the left inferior vein. And in, with the convergent, almost all of those are isolated. Uh, and so you don't have to do a lot of ablation. And I think it really reduces the, the soft chill risk so much that when you look at the, the long-term risk of convergent versus catheter ablation, they're almost identical, even though you have two procedures in a convergent. Uh, we'll skip this. This is just some AV node stuff. Try to get to what I, uh, the other part I wanted to talk about. So the long-term treatment goals reduce the risk of stroke. Guidelines would suggest anyone with, and I'm, I'll knock this out real quick. Uh, guidelines would suggest anybody with a CHAZ VAS score greater than two should be on anticoagulation, but we all know that we do a really dismal job of treating these patients for various reasons. And when you do put them on, about 30% of patients will stop in NOAC in two years and 50% will be off warfarin in two years. So the Watchman device was approved for uh, patients with a high vascular or high CHADS vascular of three or above, deemed to be able to be on warfarin for a short course and need to get off. So untreated uh, AFib, you can see that the stroke risk um, it obviously gets pretty high to, to a CHADS vasc of five is around 8%. With uh, warfarin, that drops it to around 2% at, at uh, with a CHADS VASC of five. And then 
All of these data points are from different uh, Watchman trials where you can see they're no worse than uh, warfarin and in some cases better than warfarin. Specifically, when you look at disabling uh, or fatal strokes, 55% reduction. 90% of the clots that cause stroke come out of left atrial appendage. And the Watchman is done uh, through transeptal access and EP lab under general anesthesia. Limit, it says it's about an hour procedure. My hands, it's between 15 minutes and 20 minutes. My, my average case time is around 16 minutes. Uh, one to two day hospital stay, although uh, probably 90 plus percent of my patients go home the same day. First thing you want to do is measure the LAA OS uh, in at 0, 45, 90, and 135, and then the depth. Uh, the Watchman device, the new device, the Flex device is half as deep as it is uh, wide. I'll knock these out real fast. So three different morphologies of uh, appendage and uh, you cross over, and there's a huge error on this right there, and that those are backwards. So inferior on bicable and posterior on uh, short axis. Put the sheath over, put the device in place, and position it somewhere around the left atrial os there, and uh, it utilizes over. This is a first generation device in that it has that little button. That button's no longer there. And so on the flex device, you wouldn't see anything. High six degree of success around um, over 95% uh, success, even with new operators. And um, bleeding risks drop below half down to even a 72% long term. Uh, bleeding risk. And it's a safe procedure that's uh, effective and I'll move on. Okay. So you online going and then I'll stand up and we do have a couple online questions. First, two parter from Dr. Phil Riley, cardiology. Um, first being often is a second mitral clip needed for the treatment of functional mitral regurge? And when placed, how often is the patient left with mitral stenosis? And then also, if a second clip is ever used, um, does your hospital lose money um, so on, on those cases? Okay. A um, couple of easy questions. I thought I knew ballpark the number of cases that uh, uh, needed a second clip, but uh, thanks to Bing AI, I got the precise number. Um, it's 1.4 clips per case on average. So it's, it's about 50% of the cases need a second clip. Uh, I've seen cases presented where three clips were deployed. I don't recall a case where we ever had to do three. So it, it's pretty common that two clips are required to get a good result. And the second question was about creation of mitral stenosis. Um, so that's part of the anatomic limitations. So when we look at a valve, we look at the opening orifice area to try and get a prediction of how likely we are to be able to close the jet without creating unacceptable gradients with mitral stenosis. Essentially, everybody coming out of a clip has some gradient that might qualify for at least mild mitral stenosis, and in some cases, moderate. Um, we always try to keep the transmitral gradient below about six. Um, but interestingly, in the COAP trial, um, in these people with bad ventricles, they looked at the people who ended up with higher gradients than we would normally want. I think the number is up to eight millimeters of mercury. And even then, that's well into the moderate mitral stenosis range. Those people still got all of the survival and symptomatic benefit. So routinely, we cause at least mild mitral stenosis, and occasionally we cause moderate mitral stenosis at least in the functional mitral regurgitation population, these people with bad ventricles, it doesn't seem to have a detrimental effect on long-term benefit. At the end of the question, if you raise your hand, we'll just try and recognize and move on. Okay, I'll go. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. One of my questions, I think Dr. Joe, you kind of touched on it just a little bit, but a number of years ago, I did some studies on carotid enterorectomy, comparing community experience, what happened in the published clinical trials that showed the benefit. We were, we were specifically looking at asymptomatic uh, carotid artery stenosis. What's the operator learning curve to achieve the types of results they're seeing in the clinical trials? Because at least what I've seen in the past is that what happens in the community sometimes doesn't quite come up to the same standards that happened in the clinical trials. 
that were typically being done by experts in the field. Sure, in the, in the Watchman data, um, it didn't take too many cases to get there. You know, it's kind of a, a, the flex device, especially is a very easy device to, to deploy. Um, and so I think the learning curve, you know, was inside of probably five or 10, 10 cases. Uh, sure, it comes down to the transeptal really, uh, how, how you set yourself up. You can set yourself up for failure or success uh, pretty easily. Now I'm sure in some of their cases, the, the curves get a little steeper, um, but I, I kind of echo some of what you're, what you're saying there in that one of the big studies that, that kind of killed an area of medicine that I think was, was somewhat promising was a simplicity trial, and it looked at renal denervation. And in that study, the unfortunate part was that Medtronic went out and, and found a lot of centers to do the, the cases. And what they ended up with were operators that had done two, three, four, five of them. And no one really had gotten far enough on down the curve to become proficient at it. And their study ended up as a negative trial showing renal derivation did nothing. When in actuality, it probably did a lot. It was that these patients, these people took more than two cases to learn it. And once you got the technique down, because it was very, very operator dependent, and what they found when they went back was that they were trying to do a circumferential ablation in the renal artery, but you had to take the catheter. It was a single point catheter. So you put a burn down, you collapse the catheter, you turn it, open it back up, burn again, collapse it, and you kept doing that. You had to make eight cycles. Well, if you didn't have the right feel of the catheter and when it would move, all the lesions stacked in one spot. And so when they went back and looked at the patients, all they got were in most of the patients were one ablation. And so it wasn't that renal degeneration didn't work. Renal degeneration, when you do two of them, doesn't work. So I think we need to kind of figure out where that curve is in, in things. And unfortunately, in the watchman, I think that, that learning curve is fairly shallow. Can I add something to that? Um, this balance um, is widely debated in the cardiology interventional community. So. Um, and there are two sides of the discussion. One is to say, well, this is a complex procedure and only people at major centers of excellence can do this. And if that's true, fine, but there's such a huge portion of our population that just isn't gonna get there. And so you deprive a significant portion of the population of the potential benefit. Um, so there's a balance between trying to get everybody to the Cleveland Clinic versus having a procedure available at OSU Medical Center in St. John and St. Francis. Uh, so every time we ask this question, we have to look at balance. B, I would say that one of the things that the cardiology community with guidance from FDA and Medicare and participation of industry in the topics that we've been discussing here, um, there's a lot of real world data, something that wasn't the case in carotid endarterectomy. You had to go dig out that data there was no national registry of what the pre-discharge stroke rate was for carotid endarterectomy. In this world, we have mandatory databases, and I showed you some of the real-world data with MitraClip, and uh, there are certainly some procedures that are harder to disseminate, um, but largely the stuff that I showed you, particularly TAVR, um, uh, is easily taught, easily disseminated. Um, and it is much wider disseminated now. Um, so I'm not saying every hospital in the country should do TAVR or affibrillation, whatever. Um, but most of these technologies uh, are easily disseminated and with reproducible results, certainly for TAVR and MitraClip uh, that we've talked about here today and the Watchman device, the registry real world data matches up very closely with the trial data in these instances. I'm sure there are other techniques that are much more operator dependent, require higher skill level, but for most of what we've talked about here today, pretty uh, easily disseminated and the results match the trials quite closely. I have a question. In your real world uh, application of the ablation technique, uh, for AFib, do, do you see that, you know, people that come that are obese, 
morbidly and have atrial fib <coughs> along with sleep apnea. Yeah. Do, do you require that they try to lose weight prior to ablating to improve the outcomes or do, do, I, I, I'm morbidly obese and I have AFib <laughs> and I'm chronic. Yeah. And so the question is, what do you, what do, you do? Uh, I was told by multiple EP doctors that the risk for ablation was too high at the time it was being considered. So we went with rate, rate control yeah. strategy. But no, I think, um, I think, you know, there's obese and then there's obese, right? You know, if, if you take somebody who's 500 pounds, obviously that is a lot tougher ablation. And I have a few patients out there that I've just told them, look, you're just too big. I can't get there. You know, I, we can't, can't get the catheters in the, in the space that we need to, to do anything. And so I've, I've tried to encourage them to lose weight, but for the most of our patients and pretty much anybody in this room for sure, well within the reach of, of what we're talking about here. Um, I think the BMI of over 70, I think is what it has to be before you can't do a conversion. It's, it's really, really high. I think it's 70. So no, I wouldn't, you're not even close, bud. <laughs> Call me up, we'll, bear, we'll, we'll get you fixed. I was 500 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> Sure, we have, we have several online. Second question from our online uh, group is related to TAVRs. Uh, how often in percentage does TAVR lead to difficult future coronary access due to the obstruction from TAVR stent struts? So it depends on the valve. Uh, if you have those uh, self-deploying valves, one are balloon expanding and the other are self-deploying. The self-deploying have nitinol on them, like, uh, and they, when they heat up and when you release them from their cage, they expand and they are the ones which have a cone-like structure. And uh, those are the ones which would cause or have a difficulty in access, accessing the coronary ostea after that. Although the industry is trying to point out some things where these things would align better with the cusp of the valve and give more better coronary access. What, I, what we have found so far is that, um, you know, a number of times it has happened that we have put in a valve and they came in an emergency, had an acute MI and uh, the people who have not dealt with it or who haven't done this kind of work before, they do not know exactly how to get into those coronary ostea and what catheters to use and what support wires or guides to use to get in there. Now, having said that, uh, I do not know the exact proportion of uh, different valves being used by the community and uh, what is some, because I think that is where the industry penetration comes in. You know, I have seen that in Oklahoma City and I'm sure it's all over that, uh, you know, whoever gets to this community hospital first and convinces them that they need to use this valve uh, whether it is uh, Boston Scientific, M Medtronic, or Edwards, then people go with that valve. Uh, in a center like ours, we, because have all the options, we choose the valve according to the patient. And most of the balloon expanding valves do not obstruct the coronaries. So there is no uh, reason for us to worry about obstruction of the coronaries on a balloon expanding valve. So, so to answer the question, if somebody has, and it is an approved uh, uh, technique where if you have somebody with 70, 80% stenosis, you fix the coronary first and then put the valve in. Number two, if somebody is young enough, uh, you know, you think, okay, this guy has 40% stenosis in one vessel and a 50% in the other vessel, and you can get away with a balloon expanding valve, which is a short height valve. It will not obstruct the coronaries because that's what we are measuring before we do the valve. We, measure the coronary height, we, it, you know, there are different numbers and we sh make sure that the valve is below that or um, the, the native valve does not obstruct the ostium of the coronary. So it's a rare problem, uh, but I think it's going to be more uh, prevalent as more and more people in the community do this procedure. And as uh, uh, the panelists pointed out that it is not that difficult to do the procedure, as more people learn, uh, but most of them, the problem arises that they 
are sold to one company or the other, and they do not take into account what is the best option for this patient at, let's say, 60 years of age or 65 years of age, and if we can get away with a shorter valve, or if they typically need a bigger valve, how are we going to handle the coronaries? But it's not a very common problem right now. Subsequent Taver question, um, given some of the advancements in, in transcatheter replacement, bicuspid aortic valves approach relative co absolute contraindication for Taver? Not any longer. Um, uh, there was a bicuspid registry, showed good results. Again, uh, the um, so the issue is the bicuspid valves are going to be, the analysis is going to be distorted and it is mostly oblong. Uh, but that also does not produce a lot of problems. The biggest problem is because of these uh, valves is um, the distribution of calcium. If there is heavy calcification on one leaflet and it uh, is extending into the aortic annulus or into the LVOT, the outflow tract, then you have to be careful in the sense that you are going to get a lot of paravalvular leaks. So, if the ratio of uh, the, or the dimension of the valve is such that it is way oblong, has a lot of calcium, which happens on these valves, and it is not evenly distributed, then you would rather favor surgery. On the other hand, if the calcium is evenly distributed, does not go down into the LVOT, and uh, the, uh, the valve is not too oblong, then TAVR is not a contraindication. I think we still can do, and that is just a think thing. I'm not sure the exact number is 70, 80% of the people can get TAV or 20, 30% will have to absolutely, if possible, go for surgery because of the parameters I just talked about. Can I just uh, add one thing? I think if, if there's one message that's universal across these three disease states, um, it's, um, watchfulness and don't wait. Dr. Ghani pointed out aortic stenosis is inevitably progressive. When you see mild aortic stenosis go, oh, you don't go, oh, this isn't a problem. You go, if you live long enough, you will have severe aortic stenosis. We see this time and time again. Somebody's in the hospital for something totally unrelated, appendicitis, whatever, they get an echo, mild AS it doesn't get translated from the hospital doctor to the primary care doctor, you don't even know about it. And that person doesn't get an echo for seven years, they get an echo when they land in the hospital with pulmonary edema and you have a 30%. Um, so keeping an eye out for that. And if somebody has AS, even if it's mild, they need to be on a monitoring program. With mitral regurgitation, class two, I feel fine, but you've got an EF of 40% and severe MR, fix it now, not when they have an EF of 15% in pulmonary edema. And I'm sure the same is true of AFib. If we're gonna fix it, we fix it early before the atrium model. So I think early identification and monitoring and getting these people evaluated, that would be my one overarching lesson for these three disease states. Right. When should we uh, refer in a patient that has got new onset heart murmur that's asymptomatic, probably something like a 45 year old female who's overweight, but you know, it doesn't really have any other things other than we just picked up a heart murmur and it's probably mitral regurg. I would say get an echo. And if it's mild to moderate anything, whether it's AS or MR, they probably don't necessarily need to go see somebody. I mean, if, it, if it's, if it's substantial MR or if it's moderate AS, uh, then I'd have them see a cardiologist. But if, they're, if they have a valve area of 1.7 and a mean gradient of 10 and it's mild aortic stenosis and they're asymptomatic, it, it's not harmful to get them to a cardiologist, but I'd be perfectly comfortable with you saying, Mrs. Jones, you have mild aortic stenosis. We're gonna get an echo every couple of years for now. And when your valve starts progressing in moderate range, I'm gonna get you hands of a cardiologist. And I think you can say the same for MR. Agree. Yeah, I think uh, I'll just say that it depends on your level of comfort. As long as you are a comfortable with dealing with the patient and you know exactly what disease state they are in, you can handle it. It's a cardiologist is not going to do anything different. You know, if you think that 
they need to get plugged in because of whatever reason then so it's your level of comfort uh, and obviously at the end of the day you're trying to do the best for the patient we don't want them to be going from office to office and doing stuff which is not necessary but mild as uh, it will not progress to you know moderate to severe for at least five years but if we understand the etiology of it and work on it uh, you know if you know when i was coming over we were discussing this thing if you know it's a heart team approach all of these parameters have changed recently they have changed recently why are we more interested in these people who are uh, getting a clip or a valve at an earlier stage why because we have been able to reduce the uh, morbidity and mortality with the treatment previously all the treatments open heart surgery and uh, you would like okay you know what let's wait let's wait let's try not to do this because that's going to take something out of you and it's going to be more difficult to recuperate and everything now we are a little bit interested in earlier approach just because we can do some let's say if uh, you know you put in a mitral clip i'm just saying uh, and it's not a very plausible scenario but if you put in a mitral clip and uh, although we have done it a number of times patient comes in with severe failure and they are considered not candidates for any other kind of uh, issue or uh, treatments you put in a mitral clip and uh, they get better their ef improves and they are young enough i did this uh, uh, actually 6 months ago at uh, ou medical center they had this guy in the icu for 2 months and he had uh, this uh, the same the, the lime scooter kind of thing he was going on that you know the scooters they run on the sidewalk and somebody hit him he blew open his uh, posterior leaflet and he was in the icu for 2 months with pulmonary edema and recurrent uh, pulmonary infections they could not get him to surgery eventually the surgeon called and said can you fix this so i said okay we'll try put in two clips the guy walked out of the icu in 3 days and 2 months later he got his valve replaced he could have waited but the surgeon thought that they need to do it in 2 months that's fine but there are no scenarios where you can you know have these things available even earlier and just because uh, they are effective and they are uh, I'm, you know we are, we were part of these trials we've been doing the mitral trials for the everest trial which came out first for about 15 years ago and i still have those patients who had the clip 15 years ago and they are looking the same so had several questions probably for Dr. Jewel several questions about kind of decision making for anticoagulation with proxismal afib I'll ask the question from that Dr. Wilkins submitted though uh, one of our cardiologists at OSU but reviewing a permanent pacemaker interrogation uh, with an asymptomatic patient uh, that's found to have new onset afib on the interrogation the longest salvo is 5 minutes percent burden is 0.4% Just talk through decision-making um, pathway uh, for anticoagulation and someone like that. Yeah, I mean, certainly in the literature, you see an inflection at about six minutes, and you see another inflection at about six hours. So if AFib lasts under six minutes, you can handle it one way. Uh, if it goes over six hours, it becomes even more important. If it was a young patient. Um, I put them on aspirin. If it was an older patient that was worried about, I'd probably put them on a blood thinner. Um and it'd be something where it depend on the CHAS VAS score to me. And if it was a lower, it's one of those where you know even at a CHAS VAS of 2, I'd probably use aspirin because the episodes were under 5 minutes. Another atrial fibrillation centric question. sleep apnea we kind of talked about it um or, or briefly mentioned on it but questions revolving around the mechanism of sleep apnea leading to or contributing to atrial fibrillation <coughs> and is there a difference between mild moderate severe sleep apnea well the, the more severe the sleep apnea the more likely they are to cause uh progression of afib it has to do with just the the drop of oxygen tension and and the increase in pressure in the left atrium leading to 
the, you know, the tight wall and so the stretch that happens is going to be amplified when the posterior wall is, is tight. That makes sense. Just to kind of tag off of that though, the patient that gets admitted for like pneumonia that hasn't ever had AFib or had a problem, briefly goes in AFib. I mean, when I say briefly, they're in it six, eight hours in the hospital and then spontaneously convert on their own. Do you still treat them as a long-term AFib or since we have an acute hypoxic event from their pneumonia? I don't, no, I don't. I mean, especially single, you know, first time in AFib, they're in it one time because of some inciting event. I mean, it's no different than when, when I started practice, um, one of my colleagues and I had a deer lease together and we go out and of course he was drinking and, and got pretty hammered that night, ended up throwing up next morning and missing his deer. I shot my deer, went back and uh, met him in the ER and converted him out of his AFib because, you know, he got drank himself into AFib in the middle of the night. I just waited for him to get drunk and then took all of his money. We were playing cards. And so I made money on the deal and met him in there and got him out of AFib. And so I won a couple of different ways, right? And so you wouldn't you wouldn't think that person would need to be on anything no. Dr. Jewel, there is a request for you to describe pulsed field ablation. Ah, I was wondering if anybody would ask that question. Um, that is an emerging technology, and I, I wanted to mention in it something about it in in the talk, um, and it just kind of ran out of time, but. Pulse field ablation is uh, kind of a new, a, a new way of ablating AFib. And radio frequency is what we're using now. It's an AM radio spectrum uh, that is bounced into the tissue. They use an AM radio wave because it only penetrates a few millimeters into the tissue. And I tell my patients, radio frequency ablation is like microwaving your hot dog. Your microwaves are passing through it, by causing the, the water molecules to vibrate, causing friction inside the cell and therefore conductive heating. Pulse field ablation uses a spectrum that causes the sarcolemma, kills the sarcolemma inside the cell. And so there's no heat and it is sensitive to just cardiac tissue. So you can put the catheters in there, very, very short ablation uh, times there's about two and a half seconds of ablation time uh, and it will just wipe out that cardiac tissue. The advantage there is you can be smashed right against the esophagus and have no heat, no, no transference, uh, zero risk of injury to the frank nerve. Um, it, it's, it's amazing. Now, it'll de depend on who gets it to market, how it comes to market, how it, uh, it's utilized. Um, the disadvantage to pulse field is it doesn't do anything for SCAR. There's, uh, they've been using it in Europe for a couple of years. Uh, Boston Sci will be the first to market in the US. They'll have it on the market, probably available next year uh, through a, um, a Ferropulse uh, company that they acquired. Uh, you really don't know though in these, these heavy SCAR burdens. So as AFib progresses and it becomes advanced and the degree of scarring that happens in the posterior wall um, doesn't seem to affect that SCAR at all. So there are going to be some disadvantages there, but in your paroxysmal, you know, the 33 year old with AFib, um, you know, having episode once over six months, that's gonna be, that's gonna be just money. I mean, those are gonna be, so uh, such good cases because now you don't have to worry about the risks as much. When you're ablating, are you ablating the myocytes or the neuronal structures in the myocardium? It's the myocyte. It's the, it's the myocardium itself. I mean, you're, you're hammering that. The, the, there is some thought about, you know, kind of the ganglionic plexi and everything. But when you look at the literature, uh, going after GPs, going after these uh, cafe potentials that we talked about earlier, really show nothing uh, by themselves. So it, it is, you know, there are some advantages to taking out a GP, um, but to go after just the GPs shows no advantage in AFib. Wow.
Um, so th there's actually guideline recommendations for serial echo for AS. I haven't looked to see if that's out there for MR. So the guidelines would say mild AS, it's okay to monitor every two years. Um, so my, again, as we were saying earlier, I think if you have somebody with mild AS, and no symptoms, and you can ask them and listen to them every year, uh, I think you're fine monitoring that. The key thing is to get in the record and we are watching this. Don't let it go through the cracks. Um, once it's moderate, um, the guidelines have wiggle room and they say six to 12 months. Um, so for AS, I think Uh, giving you the um, uh, from usually mild uh, AS uh, two to three years, mild MR, uh, again, the same, uh, you know, time period. But I think on MR especially, it depends on the etiology. You know, if it is uh, Barlow's disease, as they used to call it, myxomatous valve, or is it a primary LV dysfunction? And do you think you are have you have a good handle on the primary disease, whether it's ischemic heart disease, it's going to continue to dilate, it's going to stretch the valve out. So you have to do it early as compared to somebody who was diagnosed with a mitral valve prolapse at the age of 20 and has some atypical chest pain and they have trace MR. They are going to probably say, or mild MR, they're going to stay the same for a long period of time. So it really depends on the etiology, what you're thinking, especially when the LV is dilating. So even you know some people come to you for the first time, mild to moderate MR you are going to probably do if you can. So, and it also depends on the patient, how educated they are, how much they can follow their, uh, their own symptoms. Uh, you might want to do it early and see what the LV is doing, especially if it is dilating at a progressive clip, then you have to be really careful. You have to do it every six months to see. And if the EF drops, that's a really bad sign in mitral regurgitation. You know, you do not want the EF to drop even so they are usually, if quote unquote, everything is all right, they should have a hyperdynamic LV. You know, they should have a normal LV, EF 60, 65%. It gets to 55%, which is quote unquote normal. It's not good for a patient with MR because you're going to fix that valve and the EF is going to go down to 35%. So I think it depends on the etiology. The last online question. Mo, you want to come down towards the front? Yeah, last, last question from the online group. Um, commenting on 30-day post-op TAVR complication numbers looking very good. The question being, do we have data looking at six-month post-op morbidity or mortality in that cohort? Yes, we do. Uh, well, we have data on, uh, so we have long-term data. We have five-year data. And uh, we are waiting for next year for 10 year data. So, so far, uh, those uh, curves, they uh, stay the same or they diverge, which means they, they get better with the, the passage of time. The only question which is now remaining is uh, the durability of the valve. Uh, so you want to put in a valve, especially in a younger age group, when you say 65, everybody's eligible for a TAVR. Is the valve going to last them? Okay, if we can get a valve which would last, obviously it depends on the underlying conditions. That's why you exclude all the end stage renal disease patients in all these trials, because none of those valves are going to last if you put tissue valves in them. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you are 
putting in a valve and you think it's going to last 15 years. So if 65 and it's going to last till 80 and you have a guarantee that you can get another valve in there at that time. So the question is durability. The rest of the stuff, I think uh, it's pretty much resolved. We have good data to show that uh, uh, there is, uh, if anything, uh, uh, all these AFibs uh, and stroke and uh, uh, any other comorbid, all cause death, they are still lower in TAVR. And one of the biggest reason which we didn't go into the details is the amount of bleeding. We have figured out somehow or the other over a period of time, the amount of bleeding in an elderly person uh, leads to really bad outcomes. Uh, it depends on the, if you have to transfuse or they're admitted with it. Or so if they bleed and they bleed significantly, their one year mortality goes up. So just to say, you know, we had a little bit of a bleed. So that, that data is actually coming out right now. And that is why there is a scale back right now in anticoagulation. People are no longer jumping up and down and saying, okay, now it is becoming a standard of care to just put a TAVR valve on a single antiplatelet. Previously, it was always standard, put them on aspirin plavix. Or if they have AFib, which is pretty common, then put them on one of the NOAX plus something. Uh, now it is becoming in the last six months to a year, now we have figured out that, okay, bleeding is really bad. Now these, uh, it is acceptable just to put them on aspirin. So to answer the question again, yes, we have data to show that uh, uh, TAVR is doing well. Bleeding and durability are the two things which can show a detrimental effect in the long run. 